Welcome to the Bibliotheca Orientalis. Today we are going to London to meet Doris Behrens Abu Seif, a leading specialist on Mamluk architecture. My readers usually associate me with this book, uh, Cairo of the Mamluks. For an Egyptian who wants to write a book, it's not uh, difficult to, to answer why I take the Mamluk period, because the Mamluk period is the golden age of Egyptian Islamic history, a period of cultural uh, uh, and artistic flourishing and expansion, and it preceded the period where Egypt was a province of the Ottoman Empire, and Cairo was no longer the capital of an empire itself, but it was a provincial capital in an Egypt. So it is the golden age, and it's uh, we Egypt, modern Egyptians have learned to look nostalgic at this period. Regarding who were the Mamluks, this is a question which always I need to take a long breath before answering, especially in Europe, because it's always people who are always amazed uh, when they know that the Mamluks were the slave dynasty and how so slaves were ruling the country. Uh, uh, they were not exactly slaves, they were purchased to be in the army. And dynasty, it was not exactly a dynasty either, because they were to be elected every time and it was not a hereditary system. The Mamluks themselves perpetuated the system. They also purchased other Mamluks, and so the system went, and it was the Mamluks they purchased rather than the sons who were to become the successors. But in that time, anyway, as it has been said before, Cairo was the biggest city in the world, and we have hundreds of travelers, uh, accounts, and eyewitnesses coming to Cairo, which has been discovered cross road for embassies from all over the world. So there was a lot going on there, and this is the way. And there's still, most of all, in spite of so many losses in the past and in the present, Cairo is so rich in terms of medieval monuments. So you cannot escape the Mamluks when you are Cairo. part of the book is the whole cultural environment uh, of the architecture. What I want to try to do is to put the architecture as much as possible on the context, not just try to study it alone as something completely autonomous. Mamlu patronage was not about architecture. Of course it was about architecture too, but it was about building colleges or building something, or most of all building mausoleums for themselves to be commemorated. And then these buildings, these foundations, this charitable thing had to be put in building. So the building is the package of what, of the function, of the foundation. And in order to understand why the package looked like it does, we have to know what did it, what was inside the package. The major thing is to be remembered, especially that they were not in dynasty. Their sons they are not going to be the successor. The way to be remembered is to leave a monument and to create a monument to be reminded. Because they were, of not, they were originally not Muslims, they were originally foreigners, they were originally came from elsewhere and purchased, and they had, there was always a need for them to legitimize why they were ruling a Muslim country with such great tradition like Egypt. This even came early at the beginning because the Mamluk rose to power during the Crusader period, and it is thanks to their uh, victories against the Crusaders, evicting the Crusaders definitely from the Holy Land and also repelling the Mongol invasion that came up to very close, anyway, into Syria, but not the village. They were the only ones who could stop the, the, the Mongols. So this was the first way they could uh, aspire to have power because they had already done something for the Muslim nation that gave them legitimacy. 
Once the, the, the wars and the crusaders and Mongols were over, they, uh, the new um, purpose to legitimize the rule was charitable foundations and the foundation of religious institutions, and which they did in a, in a tremendous, on a tremendous scale, from the beginning to the end, building mosques, building uh, uh, monasteries, schools, uh, urban expansion. So this was the patronage. the best known, the most famous, and not necessarily the most typical of it. It's the Mosque of Sultan Hassan, because this is the mosque which every tourist would know. And it's not only that it acquired this statues in modern time, already shown after it was built, when you have travelers from mainly Italy, but also from elsewhere, coming and visiting medieval Cairo, they mentioned the Mosque of Sultan Hassan. It attracted their attention because of its position and location and also because it was the most monumental of all mosques. So it has always been, had a special statue since it's very, it was constructed, or since it was founded. And also, the Egyptian chroniclers and themselves, they considered this mosque the most significant architecturally and artistically of all monuments of Egypt. It is interesting because it's also the most monumental. The Mamluks did not build normally monumental mosques. They built mosques that were usually integrated into the urban canvas. They don't impose themselves on the urban setting. They follow, they adapt themselves to the urban setting. They integrate in the street. But this mosque was built from the beginning to be monumental and to be the biggest of all, not only in terms of architecture, but also in terms of its functions. When you read the foundation deed, the function of the mosque, it had more students than any mosque before, it had more preachers than any mosque before, more teachers than any mosque before, more muezzins than any mosque before, more minarets, everything was just mega and had to be bigger than anything that was done so far before. Sultan Hassan was not himself one of the major sultans of the Mamluk period, he was rather the son of the major sultan of an Uzbek period. Nasir Muhammad, his father, is really the golden age of Mamluk history because it's the period that followed uh, the eviction of the Crusaders and it really ruled long enough, over 40 years to, and he was ambitious and a great patron of everything. So everything flourished in Egypt uh, and in Syria and in the whole empire during the reign of his father, Nasir Muhammad. When Al uh, Sultan Hassan came to power, he was young, and he was not, he didn't have much power. He was overruled and, uh, by two mighty emirs who treated him badly and humiliated him. In my view, in my personal interpretation, I think that he, the ambition shown in his mosque had nothing to do with the period itself, because it was the period just following the Black Death. There had been tremendous death everywhere in the Mediterranean world at that time, but the economic situation was bad, where everything was suffering. He wanted to build this mega mosque because when he came to power finally, and he had really full power, he had been before that so much humiliated. I explain it in a psychological, as a kind of complex, someone who wants to show, here I am. And the result was that the mosque was never completed. Many features in the decoration and in the architecture and in the scale has never been seen before in Egypt. It has never been repeated or equaled again. And there are still many questions of how, where did they get the craftsmen, where did they get the idea, the whole design of the building is unprecedented. So it is really a very special monument and it is acknowledged as a special monument. These monuments are in daily danger of damage, of theft, of, uh, of, uh, of decay, and of bad restoration. I hope that my country people will, will, will deal with this heritage with the due respect. <laughs>